Hey guys, today I'm reading a longer fan fiction today. It's called Family Regardless of Blood or Time by Blue Sea Bird 2. This has four chapters and it's 16,252 words. And here's the summary. Shota gets sent back in time and immediately starts putting things into place to take down All for One. More importantly, he also adopts a lot of children, meets friends at the park, and joins Midoriya and go on her crusade against a society's ideology. He gets Nezu involved. He's also not as alone as he thinks. Shota woke up from his nap with a jolt sharper than a requiem. In the moments after his eyes caught on the ceiling panels above him, he was immediately aware of several things. First, he was in the staff room at UA and had been sleeping on the expulsion paperwork for his entire class. Second, a room full of professional heroes trained to teach was not somewhere he could hide the fact that every single muscle in his body had tensed to the breaking point, even if he had yet to make a single sound. Third, and most importantly, the room also included Hisashi and Nemre, who would not let professional courtesy stop them from asking if Shota was alright, because they were his friends and not professional colleagues. Damn it, Shota. Fourth, or perhaps third, dash A, Hisashi, in a particular case, could not, under any circumstances, be allowed to talk to Shota right now. Shota stood, paperwork falling off the desk haphazardly. Sound went distantly funny the moment the pages hit the floor and the noise of Nimmer talking with Snipe as the man was drinking coffee stretched and warped. With the ease of long, too long practice, Shota ignored the muted volume of the world and eyed the distance to the door, the path around the yellow and black bird that was Suzashi, whom Shota wasn't looking at and Cementos, who just entered the room with Pan Lodo at his back. Shota's chances weren't good and if he waited much longer then Hizashi would be close enough that Shota would have to look, might even meet his oldest friend's gaze and that would break him. Again, Shota threw himself out the window. He stumbled a bit as muscle memory didn't respond quite as he expected and his capture weapon had an almost unfamiliar glint in it, but his momentum was more than enough to get him seated in the windowsill on the level above the staff room. He didn't settle long. A yellow line of what could only be his ashy's hair poked out below. It probably wasn't a good thing that Shota could hear, couldn't hear his friends scream despite being able to feel its vibrations through the glass. He was smoothed this time as he used the window ledges and a convenient flag pole to lurch up another three stories. Sound rushed back with Shota's knock in the glass, the sudden physical awareness of Hisashi's yelling and the day-to-day -day noises of a hero school slamming into him hard enough that his next knock had a more Socrates beat. Nezu opened the window casually only lifting the brow when Shota lunged inside, managing not to fall by a dent of habits long ingrained in a man who preferred lead tops to sidewalks. Shota ignored his boss and staggered into the corner of the room to sit on a small purple couch that sat across from a black armchair beside a chessboard. Somehow, this corner was almost always overlooked by visitors to Nezu's office, and Shota helped hoped it would give him the extra moment of peace in case he had been outside longer than he had thought and his ashy memory burst through the door. Except they wouldn't. Shota ran away from people, not towards people, and this he counted as people. Worse, this he counted as authority. No one, especially his friends, would expect Shota to come here. I'm going to have a breakdown on your couch. As he lowered his deep cup, dark eyes, dissecting Shota's movements as he, the teacher, leaned back in his office chair. Shota ran one hand through his hair, then lowered it to stare at the tambour that was working its way through his fingers. It's going to be bad, and I need you to not let Hisashi remember it or anyone else find me what I do. 
You seem rather sure that I'll do such a thing as our son. Shota opened his mouth, ready to comment on the fact that Shota had always made Nazu curious, even this far back, with, with his hatred of the spotlight and ruthless tendencies, with the addition no, of Shota's really odd behavior, Nazu was hardly going to pass up a chance to puzzle Shota out. Shota didn't say any of that. You're safe, he said instead, and Nazu was. He was territorial and protected what was his with animalistic curiosity he had long convinced the world he didn't have, and the intelligence he had long convinced the heroes was his most dangerous trait. Yue was his, the students were his, the teachers were also his. Shota was his. Shota heard the glass in his own tone, heard the shards cut up his words and present them to Nezu as an offering. You're safe, and I'm going to need help, and you'll figure it out anyways. Shota's breath shook out of his body. This way I won't have to say it. Say what, Asawa-san? Nezu asked, because he cared, but he also pushed. Deku's dead. Again, the words weren't the ones that Shota had planned on saying. He wasn't sure he had ever planned on saying those particular words, to be honest. Even as they burrowed into his lungs and scarred, scarred there, just like the image of one for all destroying Izuku's body as he gave it up for this one impossible chance. Nezu cocked his head. I don't know who that is. Someone you would have liked. The answer poured out of Shota, turning out of his throat and bringing great reconciles as penetration. He wrapped thin arms around his middle, bending in half and touching his forehead to his knees. He distantly registered Nezu on the phone, cheerfully announcing to the person on the other end, his, probably Hisashi, that Shota had been working on a case for Nezu and had a breakthrough. That meant he would be absent for the next few days. Shota didn't bother to try and keep quiet. He knew in the part of his brain that was still coherent that never stopped because stopping was dangerous and dangerous meant death. That the acoustics in the cor this corner were designed not to carry. He also knew that he wouldn't succeed even if he did try. As he wouldn't judge, regardless, the not knew what the aftermath of torture looked like, what it felt like. It took a long time for Shota to be able to concentrate on something other than the rattling in his bones. Enough time, apparently, for Nezu to have made three separate cups of tea and placed them on the table by the chessboard. Two were curled, but one was just faintly steaming. Steaming. The scent of jasmine attempting to wrap around Shota, embrace him long enough to breathe. Nezu looked up from his tablet when Shota reached for the steaming cup, humming approvingly and looking deliberately at a quilted blanket laying folded over the chessboard. Shota smiled, or he would have, if he could get the muscles in his jaw to work properly. Instead, he blinked, reaching out with a slow hand to grab the blanket and drop its floor diamonds over his lap, idly distracting himself with the thought of punching everyone who had ever said Nezu didn't have feelings in the face. Nezu might sometimes have trouble acting on an emotional basis, or on acting on other people's emotions, but Shota certainly thought the blanket and tea were pretty fucking great. He hadn't even noticed he'd been cold, but the warmth seeping into his skin was bracing. He actually felt like he might be able to stop shaking at some point in the future, if he was very lucky and no one touched him. I don't remember earning this kind of trust. Shota heard trust and translated it to loyalty, knowing loyalty was what he had shown. Sure, he trusted Nezu enough to break down in his office, but they both knew Shota was capable of disappearing into the depths of the city or even the school to have his breakdown in peace. Shota had found the problem, a significant one, and come to Nezu for help in solving it. Shota was deteriorated too, and possessors besides. Yeah, Shota told his tea. Nezu hummed again, pressing small paws together. How much time do we have before the first trigger point for the future you aim to prevent? And Shota would die for this creature. He would. 
so he'd rather avoid that outcome all told. Deku would be mad at him if he didn't. But Nesu believed Shota without Shota having to have said a word, and more importantly, he hadn't asked how long. Shota wasn't sure he could bear having to say that he didn't know that they had stopped counting towards the end. Shota fought back sluggishly, moving past the DK and the rot and the green, green, green to the days of being a regular teacher. He had only ever expelled the entirety of cl his class once, the second year of his career at UA. Seven years. Seven years to his how class, his kids. Officially, like hell he was going to wait that long. Todoroki and Sunjo in particular needed a checkup. In Taku, it had just been Shota and Nezuka in the end. I assume you have goals? Several. Excellent. Nezu clapped his paws together and reached for a notebook. Shota's heart hurt. If you tell me the ones I can help with, you can, we can put... Oh my god. Excellent. Nezu clapped his paws together and reached for a notebook. Shota's heart hurt. If you tell me the ones I can help you with, we can prioritize our immediate efforts. I'll put it on to, out to the staff that you're using your newly cleared schedule to help me with a few personal projects. I guess some things won't change. Shota snorted, watching ripples form in his, in his tea. Use this your last time round to discover a like for having an underground hero on call. I like having information that was scarily accurate. Always happy to please, and as he paused, you'll have to disappear, lose contact for at least a month. I mean, that would be helpful. Finding Shigaraki would be a trick and a half, but Shota had promised Izuku. I mean, that would be helpful. Finding Shigaraki would be a trick and a half, but Shota had promised. Izuku had been pretty sure the future villain had spent several years on the streets before Alpha One had found him. Izuku had been so sure that the child could be saved without the monster whispering in his ear. Shota wasn't as confident, but Izuku's smile could get him to do much worse than try to save a boy. His teacher instincts already wanted to help. For the trauma, I saw son. You won't be able to explain many of your reactions, particularly if what I've seen today is any indication. An extended stay in captivity would explain much of your behavior. That is, if you don't plan on telling them. I don't. Couldn't. Couldn't ever. How could he tell how one society had ended? That his world had basically stopped even as he breathed and fought and lost. How did he tell his friends that everything they did was futile, that it hadn't mattered in the end, that they'd still die in his arms? Shota had survived because his kids had survived and would never stop fighting as long as any of his kids were alive, even if each of his kids' deaths had been worse than, the mi than a missing limb. Deku had made it to the end, so Shota had as well. Shota extended both his legs for a moment, wondering how long it would take to get used to the lack of lack of a prosthetic. He took to his head, fuck. Nothing harmed. We're going to need to talk to All Might. Shota didn't go missing for a month, partly because dismantling Awful One's motherfucking empire took nine months, partly because he refused to do that to his friends. He still hadn't seen them in nine months, but they had conversations, short ones, communications. Hisashi was worried sick, which really was a reasonable response. Numeri was furious. Shoto wasn't unaware that her recommendation for joining UA was supposed to help ground him and keep him out of some of the most dangerous areas he had been looking in before his teaching job. It had even worked the first time around. Only the fact that Nezu had briefed the UA staff on Shota's current placement with All Might gave Shota some wiggle room and prevented his friends from storming the country looking for him, as they had friends to do at least three times. He loved his friends so much, and that was more based on what Shota working with All Might meant about the severity of the situation than the hype of All Might being the number one hero. Shota's friends had better taste than that. 
the Emperor wasn't destroyed in those nine months. Not completely. They were close. They'd reduced Alphorn to a handful of locations and avoided the battle that had crippled All Might's entirely. Shota felt he could leave the remainder of the battle to All Might and Sir Nidai, partly because particularly since all that remained were the large-scale takedowns that were much more daylight heroics than the silking information and monobreeding and sabotage that Shota had been doing so far. That wasn't to say that Shota wasn't demanding constant updates, something that Ahmet himself was supremely willing to accommodate. The man was perhaps viewing the updates as a condition to Shota's agreement to go home. All Might had prepared an entire bumbling speech about how they can handle the rest. Eraser had had done in so much, they had an inside man. Please go rest, Shota. Shota possibly had a hard time resisting such genuine care from the former Scarecrow, who had maybe sort of been his friend once upon a time. The man also wasn't wrong. For all that Shota couldn't tell Yagi that Shota had burned out years ago and two years ago. So he was home. He would go back to school tomorrow. He would go back to UA and walk into the staff room and see his friends. He was not ready. He wanted it more than almost anything and he was not ready. He didn't flinch when the woman sat next to him and jolting him out of his thoughts, though he did close his eyes briefly. He knew this was coming, really. A grown man cannot sit at a park within sight of the play equipment all by himself and not expect someone to comment. Not with how frequently he'd been here in the last week as he wrapped things up and tried to get ready for school. Shota started to turn, hand already going for his hero license and mouth opening to promise he wasn't some creep. His brain skipped, however, at the feel of a cold hand over his and grass green, life grass green eyes meeting his. That's hardly necessary, he was ahead. I know exactly who you are. Adoria Inko gave his hand, the one holding his license, a gentle pat and withdrew, smiling softly. You've long been one of my son's favorite heroes. Both of my son's favorite. She looked to where a small green haired boy was laughing while being pushed on the swings. Midoriya Suku looked like he was having the time of his life, bubbling away at the older boy during the pushing. It's Rimura Midoriya Tenko, Midoriya Tenko, the moment the paperwork went through, was snarking at his new brother but using his glove covered hands with infinite carefulness to keep the swinging motion going. Shota wondered how long it had taken for Izuku to talk Tenko into touching him with the gloves. Probably not long at all. Tenko recognized, Tenko recognized you the first time you sat down, which involved a lot of staring, which tipped Izuku off. The only reason you didn't get mobbed by heroes and grateful children this Tenko is convinced you're here on a mission and refuses to let himself or his baby brother get in your way. Ah, uh, was all Shota found himself able to say for a long moment. You disagree? Inko hummed, watching the children with Shota instead of looking at the man beside her. I think you're mourning. Breath froze in Shota's lungs and he felt his muscles lock up in fetal fight or flight response. I've lost all my family except for my boys in one way or another, Inko continued softly. The library I work at is barely a street away from the hospital. I know what grief looks like, Eraser Head. She leaned forward slightly, still not looking at him. You saved my son. You saved Tenko from the streets and from the people, who would never see him as more than a villain. You saved him from himself. He remembers you and your words and your challenge to be better than the heroes who ignored him, to be the hero for the next kid like him. Shota wanted to close his eyes, wanted to run away, but he couldn't bring himself to move. He hadn't done much of anything. 
Sure, he had found Tenko dirty and angry and tucked into the shadows of an alleyway that was perfect for the murder scene of a big action movie. Sure, he would talk to the kid as he'd fed him a couple of meals, earning at least a little trust before dumping him into the system. Sure, he'd made sure the people in the system Tenko had met had been secretly a therapist and court counselor vetted by future knowledge and Nezu, both, and Midoriya Inko herself. But that was it. Shota had fled afterwards, had refused to interact with the face that was so different and so similar to the one who had been responsible for the deaths of many of Shota's students, his kids, his family. He'd watched up, he'd sat on any one of the many park benches and watched as baby Zuku, baby Deku, had enjoyed and hugged and babbled the confusion and hostility out of his new big brother. His new big brother with the super cool quirk who understood what it meant to be ostracized by society, to be vic- to be a victim to casual cruelty. Shota had watched and forgiven. How could he not when he saw Tenko's spine go from the hunched rest that shouldered rage and fear and hurt to the delicate steel that formed the backbone, a near fatal desire to protect this one good thing, how could he not when that one good thing was a suku? Not Shota Suzuku, but a suku. How could Shota not when that was the same expression that he'd seen in the fucking mirror the last time he'd been able to bring himself to look? You brought me my son, a piece I didn't even know I was missing from my family. I. She fought it for the first time since she'd sat down. I was considering, I wasn't sure I was going to take in any more fosters. Not after the last one she did Izuku. Not after how easily their justified hurt and anger found an outlet in my son, and how sad he was when not even his foster siblings wanted to be his friend. She shook her head. I know grief raised her head. I know grief-stricken exhaustion. You saved my son, both of them, by giving them each other. I'm more than happy to listen if you want. Shota didn't turn to face her. He didn't imagine he would be able to hold up against any version of the Midoriya eyes. Will you tell me about your child? It, it's not that simple. He isn't, wasn't mine. I, the words caught in his throat, which Shota figured was fine since he hadn't meant to say anything anyways. He tipped forward and let his hair cover his face. Ankle hummed again, softly, like the opening buds to a symphony. I imagine it is often very complicated with heroics and the quirks and motivations you must be exposed to. They sat in silence for a long moment, watching baby Zuku take a leap off the swings and tumble to the ground, laughing. Tenko ran to pick him up and eagerly fell and prayed to baby Izuku's octopus arms. Shota thought about telling Inko about his Izuku, about his son, because it was complicated, but Izuku hadn't called Shota anything besides that sour in the end. The thought about telling her his son was quirkless, because for all the power of one for her, Izuku had always felt quirkless. Thought about telling her his son was a hero, because Izuku had always been a hero. He thought about all the things he would never tell her. The nights holding each other after finding another classmate gone. The injuries patched up with an ever dwindling first aid kit. The look on Suzuki's face when he figured out he could give up one for all for a one shot at something as ridiculous as time travel. He liked green, Shota said, voice layered with blood and ghosts and emergencies. He liked green and yellow and had a sweet tooth much larger than he ever let on. He was smart and brave and so, so kind. I miss him. He misses his dad. His dad saw he was never supposed to do this alone. He wasn't. He couldn't. Except he would. He had to. A chance for his dad and his friends and his mom and all the hundreds of thousands of civilians to live without ever knowing the horrors of an awful one. He would do it. He would return to the past in the same location as one where he had left the future, deep in one of Awful Wind's lairs. There had been a fire and explosion and several dead. 
he taken advantage of the chaos, started yelling at the peons after stealing a white coat from and ID from someone who wouldn't be getting up again. He didn't feel badly about it, not really. He recognized the name, had done extensive research on the man as part of the failed efforts to bring down off one in the future. Not only could he fake the deceased intelligent quirk with relative ease, but the world was much better off without that particular brand of cruelty. Yuzuku had cleaned up the mess, let himself be shuffled to the medical, and allowed his extensive injuries to be played off as being due to the incident. He'd have to hack into some of the records later to shift some things around, but he could do that. He could. He could pretend to be a monster. He suddenly no longer felt like a hero. He stood in the room with the man whose identity he'd stolen. He stood and shook. Shook from the explosion, shook from the time travel, shook from the loss of one foil, shook from the pain, shook from the sheer utter loneliness of losing the only person he had left, shook from the image of his bad sour turning to face hundreds of low level villains in a mockery of the first day at the USJ, blood in his teeth and ghost in his bones as he brought Izuku time to reach the equipment and sacrifice his borrowed quirk for this one last shattered chance. Izuku shook as he closed his eyes for a nap, borrowed dreams already wrapping around his bones as awareness faded away. So that was the first chapter. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, Izuku time travel fix it fan fictions and I promise you guys it gets so much better in the next three chapters uh, anyways I hope you like this um, and I'll see you guys next time